since everyone else started like that, I'm not sure I'd be any different, right? Um, I, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about my own journey of uh, becoming a filmmaker, sort of why I made the film I made, and, and, and the sort of challenges of making it. Just to give you guys an idea of what it's like working from the, you know, from the inside trying to make the kind of change that we're talking about here. Um, I, am, I grew up, I was the first in my family born in the U.S. My father is Palestinian, my mother is Jordanian. And I was born, of all places, in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I grew up sort of going back and forth between the Midwest and the Middle East. And in, uh, in the Midwest, it was a really small town in Ohio that my parents ended up moving to, a town of 10,000 people that they thought was really quaint and safe and there was like a zero crime rate. Of course, they didn't take into account that there was zero culture as well. Um, so, we were one of a handful of immigrant families there. There was maybe uh, one other Arab family. And for the most part, everything was okay. You know, I wanted to be an all-American. I prayed that I would wake up with blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, we, we didn't really fit in, and there was no anonymity in this small town. Everyone knew everyone and knew everyone's business, so there was no hiding who we were. And uh, for the most part, I was like, the rebellious first generation teenager who just wanted to, you know, forget that my parents were foreign. And uh, then the first Gulf War hit, actually. It was 1991, I was 14 years old, and it was, a, it was actually an event that completely changed my life and set me on the path that I am on today. Um, my father went from being, and he was a physician, he still is a physician, and uh, he went from being sort of the local town hero to becoming the enemy overnight. And literally we got death threats on a daily basis, it was love it or leave it, we'll get Saddam and we'll get you too. Um, my father lost a lot of his patients, people would walk into his office and ask for their medical records and walk back out because they didn't want to see an Arab doctor. Uh, his name is Nazi, spelled N-A-Z-I-H, so he was, became known as the Palestinian Nazi. And the best part, actually, was when the Secret Service came to my high school to investigate a rumor that my 17-year-old sister threatened to kill the president. Yeah. She was very threatening to me, but definitely not the president. So, um, it was really, uh, it was so eye-opening for me, and I just, you know, it was very much my own political coming of age. I became obsessed with you know, sort of my, where, you know, the Arab culture and the politics in the Middle East and the media and the way the media was portraying us. Um, I started to really notice that, uh, that media and Hollywood films were really perpetuating the stereotypes of, of Arabs and Muslims and Middle Easterners or Middle Eastern looking people as, as terrorists. And, uh, and it really became a life, a life, sort of life's obsession. Like I was 14 thinking, I, I want to change that. I have no idea how, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I have to do something about this. Um, and you know, it was movies like, uh, True, is it True Lies? True Lies and The Siege, and those kinds of things that I started really noticing. And of course, you know, I was 14 and when I said to my father, I want to, you know, I think I want to be a filmmaker, I want to be a media maker or something. He was like, you can't do that, you're an Arab. <laughs> And you know, I think it was his way of saying, like, I don't want you to be disappointed. And it's really funny because Adina said it, like, we have to encourage young people to pursue this. And I think that everything really did come to a head in, you know, in this country um, on 9-11, where I think, you know, a lot of us really stood up and said, okay, enough, we really have to do something about this. Uh, but anyway, getting back to 1991, it took me about 10 years to figure out, you know, that, you know, how exactly I was going to pursue making this change. And, and over the course of, you know, over the course of that time, I had more and more reasons for why I wanted to do it. I mean, there was just more and more sort of um, uh, incidences of, of prejudice and stereotypes. And I ended up, I actually lived in D.C. for four years, and I thought I wanted to pursue politics and journalism and maybe lobbying, and I thought maybe that was the way to change the media and perceptions of, of Arabs and Middle Easterners and Muslims. And I quickly, it was funny because it was during the whole Clinton, Monica, Lewinsky scandal, and I actually very quickly became disillusioned with politics and personally decided that it was be easier for me to, um, to tell the truth in fiction than it would be to tell the truth in, in reality. So I, I moved to New York to go to film school. I did my MFA at Columbia University. And funny coincidence was that I moved to New York the week before 9-11. So the best part was I had relatives in the West Bank calling me, asking me if I was okay. Um, I never thought that would happen. But um, 
it was really during that time that I that I sat down and decided to start writing my story. I mean, the U.S. was invading Iraq again, and I realized that um, history was repeating itself. And I was hearing about all kinds of um, Arabs and Muslims and Middle Easterners being scapegoated. So I sat down to start writing um, Amrika. And the journey of making the film is a very interesting one, and I think really sheds some light on the, how far we've come, but how much further we have we have to go. Um, you know, Amrika is the first movie uh, in the U.S. made, the first movie about Middle Easterners in the U.S. made by a, an Arab, a Middle Easterner. I mean, most of them, if you look at movies like Syriana or uh, Rendition or, um, what was the other one that you mentioned? Even The Visitor, even The Visitor. These movies are all made by non-Middle Eastern, you know, Americans. And so it was interesting when I started writing in Rika and I, I, I went out and, and, you know, took some meetings and was pitching it to various mini majors and producers and financiers. Everyone was sort of like, you know, but aren't you an Arab? Like, that's, you're, not, you're not really objective. You know, like, they had a real fear of, of like, they thought I was going to be preaching to the choir. And it, it became really apparent to me that the more Americans make those movies, the less people like me are able to make those movies because everyone thinks that I'm going to be biased and that an American is going to be more objective. And that was actually a really interesting challenge in making this film. I mean, not that I have any idea what we do about that. <laughs> um, I, and I think that, uh, I think that America will hopefully shift, shift that because of the, the reception that it's getting. But um, I went out to pitch this film in 2004 and 5, and at the time everyone was looking for like the heavy Iraq war drama. They were looking for, for the renditions, and they were looking for they were much more interested in, in the white people telling the story than in the actual you know Middle Eastern telling the story. Um, but it, and it took you know finding the financing for this film was a huge challenge. It took five years. And, uh, and my favorite comment that I got all the time was like, it's so culturally specific. And of course, it's an immigrant story, so that's sort of what those stories were built upon. Um, I think what they meant was that it's, you know, it's too, it's too Palestinian, it's too Arab. But uh, five years later, I actually found the financing for the film within my own community. Um, I am actually, uh, we, we pre-sold the Middle East, which means that we're getting distribution there, and they came in to, as part of our financing, and we actually um, found private equity in the Arab American community. And we shot in Canada. We, we took advantage of the Canadian tax credits and provincial equity and got, and got the movie made. And one of the shocking things to me has been the reception of the film, because I think in the back of my mind I really did internalize that thing that my dad said to me. And the fact that it's being so well received, and I think that part of it is about the timing. You know, we world premiered at Sundance days before Obama was inaugurated. And there has been a real shift in this country around, you know, the new administration. So it, there really is such incredible receptivity right now. It's sort of unbelievable to, to me um, as someone who sort of struggled to, to get this movie made and to figure out how to make it really accessible. I mean, the film, which I know no one here has seen because it's not been released yet, it's being released in September. Um, the film follows a Palestinian single mom who immigrates to the U.S. from the West Bank with her teenage son and um, winds up with relatives in rural Illinois. So I definitely bring in a lot of my own personal experience growing up in the middle of nowhere, um, surrounded by cornfields. And, um, and the, the movie is really about her integrating into American culture at a time when, you know, politically, she's not really welcome. Um, but I think what's unique about the film and what makes it really accessible, and part of the reason for why people are so receptive to it, is that you know this main character is is not what you would expect at all. I mean, she's a Palestinian single mom. She is um, incredibly strong. And even though she has every reason to be cynical, she's full of hope. Despite all of the obstacles, despite all of the challenges, she maintains this really optimistic attitude. And um, people, you know, the characters, the, the people in the small town, really, you know, fall in love with her. I mean, she's quite an endearing character, and that's not something that we've, you know, that we get to see very, op very often, if, uh, if ever. So the film actually has done incredibly well. It was released in France in June, and we just grossed a million dollars in France. Yeah. Um, in the US, we're, we're releasing in September. It's gonna be released in New York and Los Angeles September 4th, and we're doing a five-week national rollout. It's definitely coming to DC. Um, and, and it'll be like on 50 screens in 30-some markets all over the US by, by the early October. So um, 
I hope you'll get to catch it. And actually, with screening at National Geographic, yeah, if you, I don't know if we're passing these around, but it's actually screening at National Geographic tomorrow at noon. So if you can make it, please come. Thank you.